Former Premier Li Keqiang passes away at the age of 68. Foreign Minister Wang Yi meets U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Washington. Funeral is held for family of journalists killed in Israel's bombing in Gaza. Good evening and welcome to TVB News. China's former Premier Li Keqiang died at the age of 68 from a heart attack in Shanghai on Friday. Li, who had a doctorate degree in economics from Peking University, served as Premier for a decade before stepping down in March this year. The sudden news of Li Keqiang's death was announced this morning on state media outlet CCTV. The broadcaster said, Comrade Li Keqiang, who had been resting in Shanghai recently, had a sudden heart attack on October 26th, and after all out efforts to revive him failed, died in Shanghai at 10 minutes past midnight on October 27th. He was 68. China's former premier was born in Anhui province in 1955. He was a law graduate from Peking University and later earned a doctoral degree in economics. Li was elected as the alternate secretariat of the Chinese Communist Youth League Central Committee in 1983. In 1998, he was transferred to provincial work and became governor of Henan province at the age of 44, the country's youngest governor at the time. In 2004, he was transferred to Liaoning province as party secretary. <laughs> Li entered China's core leadership in 2007 as the youngest member of the Politburo Standing Committee. Li Keqiang, the following year, he was appointed as vice premier. In 2013, he succeeded Wen Jiabao as premier and served a second term in 2018. In 2020, the year when the COVID outbreak started in Wuhan, Li Keqiang went there to lead anti-epidemic efforts while giving support to health workers. In order to help the economy, Li advocated street stall economy to create job opportunities, but the proposal faced widespread criticism. In August 2021, Li inspected the deadly floods in Henan province and promised to help victims rebuild their homes. Last year, he hosted his last press briefing as Premier. Li Keqiang said he and his colleagues would do all they can to fulfill their promises. In March this year, he submitted his final report to the central government. The late former Premier Li Keqiang visited Hong Kong several times in various capacities. Back in 2011, Li visited the SCR for three days. Apart from taking district tours, Li announced 36 measures to show the central government support for Hong Kong's economic and social development. Jacqueline reports. Twelve years ago, then Vice Premier Li Keqiang embarked on a three-day trip to Hong Kong in mid-August. I hope to get around more, see more, and listen more here, Li said. So he did. Li took the time to visit an elderly home in Ho Mountain. <laughs> Li said the success of Hong Kong today was the result of the efforts of the older generation. Li then headed to Painting Estate in Lambton. After tapping views from public housing tenants, Lee said public housing was important in addressing the city's housing problems. Yeah. Another stop, the middle-class Laguna City. Lee visited the family of Kwok Kwai Ming, who worked at the drainage services department, and took the opportunity to praise the work of civil servants in Hong Kong. Today, the Kwok still keep the tea set gifted by the former Premier Well. Apart from expressing sadness over Lee's sudden passing, Kwok said Lee at the time encouraged people in Hong Kong to put in concerted efforts for the good of the community. 
都發覺佢係都好關心我哋。Mrs. Quag also remembered Lee's caring attitude when asking about their family life. During Lee's three-day trip to Hong Kong, he announced 36 new policies. They included expanding the Mainland and Hong Kong Closer Economic Partnership Agreement, or SIPA, and allowing Mainlanders to buy Hong Kong stocks indirectly. Lee also attended the centenary ceremony of the University of Hong Kong, where he delivered a speech in English. HKU is for China. It has become a key higher education institution in China playing an increasingly important role in China's development and its integration with the world. Li also officiated the completion ceremony of the new government headquarters at Tamar. After becoming Premier, Li spoke about many Hong Kong issues, including the Occupy Central movement in 2014 and the social unrest in 2019. While saying that Beijing's policy direction and support for Hong Kong would remain unchanged. In 2022, Hong Kong was pummeled by the fifth wave of COVID pandemic. He urged the SAR government to shoulder the responsibility to fight the virus. Over the 10 years of his tenure as Premier, three SAR chief executives had paid duty visits to see Lee. Li called on the city's leaders to resolve the livelihood issues of Hong Kong people. As early as the 80s, Li led a delegation of all China Students' Federation to visit Hong Kong. He also witnessed the handover of Hong Kong in 1997. Jackie Lin, TVB News. Foreign Minister Wang Yi met with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Washington, which could help pave the way for a possible future meeting between Presidents Xi Jinping and Joe Biden. Chinese state media said the two sides conducted an in-depth exchange of views on China-U.S. relations and other issues of common concern. Wang called for joint efforts from China and the United States to bring bilateral relations to the track of stable and sustainable growth. Dan Rao tells us more. Foreign Minister Wang Yi held his first meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at the start of his three-day diplomatic visit to Washington. Good evening. I'm very pleased to welcome Foreign Minister Wang Yi to the United States. I very much look forward to constructive conversations over the next two days. Blinken also expressed his condolences on the passing of former Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. Wang said China and the U.S. share important common interests and challenges that they need to resolve together. Wang said China and the United States need to have in-depth and comprehensive dialogue. Wang said such talks would help reduce misunderstandings, help stabilize China and the U.S.'s relationship, and return it to the track of healthy, stable and sustainable development. Wang's visit to Washington comes after several top U.S. officials, including Blinken, visited Beijing in the past several months. Analysts expect Wang's talks in the U.S. to focus on preparations for an anticipated meeting between President Xi and U.S. President Joe Biden on the sidelines of the APEC summit in San Francisco from the 11th to the 17th of November. It would be Xi and Biden's first in-person meeting since the summit in Bali last November. Wang and Blinken will continue their discussions on Friday, with Wang also expected to meet U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Furthermore, Wang is also reportedly expected to speak with U.S. President Biden during his visit to the White House. Dunwell, TV News. The United Nations General Assembly will vote later today on a potential pause in the Israel-Hamas conflict. Hamas representatives have told Russian media there will be no more hostage releases until a ceasefire is in place. This as Israel has struck more Hamas targets in the Gaza Strip after killing the family of a journalist earlier. David Garrett reports. Al Jazeera's correspondent in Gaza, Wahil al Dahdu, mourning four members of his family who were killed in an Israeli airstrike. <laughs> These women wail with children among the dead. <laughs> Gaza's health ministry says 7,000 Palestinians have been killed since Israel began its campaign against Hamas three weeks ago. Israel has hit dozens of targets across Gaza in the last 24 hours. The number of dead keep rising as the fighting continues. The Israel Defense Force released images from a second day of incursions into Gaza. The night vision shots show tanks rolling into the besieged enclave. This is followed by airstrikes using drones and jets. The military says it is to prepare the battlefield ahead of a widely expected ground invasion. The war has entered its 21st day following the Hamas attack on October the 7th, which killed over 1,000 Israelis. 
As the humanitarian crisis in Gaza deepens, the 193 members of the United Nations General Assembly will vote on a ceasefire. The two sides put their cases. The man on the ground is an agricultural worker from Thailand. He's not Israeli, he's not Jewish. He was merely alive trying to make a living for his family. But he was decapitated with a blunt gardening tool. Horrifying. Check out your mobiles. <clears throat> Thousands of videos depicting the abomination, the horror, the, unhumanity, the inhumanity to which thousands of Palestinians are being subjected and have been subjected. Killing Palestinian. Jordan, acting on behalf of Arab countries, proposed the vote for a humanitarian ceasefire. Palestine's ambassador to the UN urged members to stop the killing, stop the madness. The European Union has been wrangling with each other on their stance. Germany and Austria are among Israel's biggest supporters. Spain and Ireland are concerned about the plight of the Palestinians. In the end, the bloc settled on calling for humanitarian aid corridors. The Commission is very important that we continue to intensify our efforts to deal with the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The aid needs to reach Gaza unhindered and quickly. The 56 tons of aid that our two first humanitarian flights brought to Egypt have now been delivered to Gaza. This is important, but of course more is needed. As for more than 200 hostages kidnapped by Hamas, a representative from the group told Russian newspaper Commerçant there will be no more releases until a ceasefire is in place. In Australia, 200 balloons and shoes were placed in a Sydney square to represent those missing. Meanwhile, hundreds of Muslims held prayers for peace in Melbourne and showed solidarity with the Palestinians. They are hoping a settlement can be found to end the war. David Garrett, TVB News. The US military has hit two facilities in Syria, saying they are used by Iranian forces and affiliated groups. The Pentagon said they were self-defense strikes after attacks on US troops in the region. They stress the strikes are separate from the Israel-Hamas war. U.S. President Joe Biden sent a rare direct message to Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei warning against attacks on U.S. military. The U.S. says their military have been targeted at least 16 times this week. Still to come on tonight's news, large numbers of illegal immigrants arrested at sea. University of Hong Kong develops AI system to help stroke patients. In the U.S., a manhunt continues in Maine, a gunman. Welcome back to TVB News. More than 20 suspected illegal immigrants were taken away by the police after they were found crying for help on Wagland Island. This is the third case involving illegal immigrants within the last week. Some lawmakers said there is an increasing trend of illegal workers coming to the SAR and urged relevant authorities to redouble efforts in tackling the issue. Timothy Lee tells us more. A group of alleged illegal immigrants were taken away by law enforcement officers to the Marine Police Aberdeen base. At around 6 this morning, some fishing vessels found some people crying for help on Wagland Island, located in the southeast of Hong Kong. The fishermen reported the incident to the police, who arrived at the scene to find at least 28 non-ethnic Chinese individuals. Earlier this week, authorities had arrested suspected illegal immigrants at Saikung's Kuochao Islands and High Island Reservoir on Sunday and Wednesday, respectively. Chairman of the Legislative Council Panel on Security, Gary Chan, said he believes most of the suspects arrived in the SAR to become illegal workers. He added they may have been planning to work in construction to make some quick money in the city. In the past three years, under COVID border restrictions, Hong Kong recorded an average of between 1,000 and 2,000 illegal immigrants annually. More than 800 of them were arrested in the first three quarters of this year. Over 70 percent of them were non-ethnic Chinese. This, as figures from the Immigration Department's online reporting of immigration offenses, recorded more than 500 cases as of March this year. Lawmaker Gary Chan said many illegal immigrants may still be hiding and yet to be caught by authorities. He stressed the need for the government to strengthen law enforcement in this area. 
He added the SAR needs to increase intelligence sharing channels with its Southeast Asian partners to conduct cross-department operations regarding illegal workers. Timothy Lee, TVB News. The University of Hong Kong has developed a mobile app to help patients suffering from stroke with recovery exercises with the help of artificial intelligence. The research team in HKU teamed up with the Rehab Society to create an app that contains 10 sets of muscle training. With AI, the camera lens in smartphones or tablets will detect the user's body type, assess joint angles and changes in speed to determine if the movement is appropriate and provide suggestions. The system will also come in handy for physical therapists to monitor patients' performance remotely. In the coming few months, the program will be tried out in different medical institutions. The system is expected to benefit some 3,000 patients in the initial stage. Deputy Chief Secretary for Administration Warner Chuck said authorities will begin enforcement actions for littering next week. Chuck stressed as many stores will not be able to handle receiving multiple fines in a single day, there isn't a need for authorities to implement a system of progressive fines. The littering fine was raised to $3,000 starting this week, while the fine for illegal shop extensions was raised to $6,000. Police in Maine in the northeast of the United States are still looking for a gunman who killed 18 people at a bowling alley and a restaurant. Robert Card remains a person of interest and is being pursued by law enforcement but has not yet been located. The manhunt continues. David Garrett reports. It was quiet at Shemenji's Bar and Grill restaurant on Thursday. The only evidence that something terrible had happened one day before were the police vehicles and the investigators outside. At least seven men were killed here. The shooter had already visited a bowling alley where others were shot dead. This small community is grieving. This is a dark day for me. I know it's hard for us to think about healing when our hearts are broken. But I want every person in Maine to know that we will heal together. Many in Maine are scared with a gunman still on the loose. The manhunt was continuing more than 24 hours on from the shootings. Police released images of the suspected gunman but told the public not to approach. Authorities have made 40-year-old Robert Card a person of interest. Card is a trained weapons expert, had military training and was in the Army Reserves. He underwent treatment in a mental facility earlier this year. Currently, there is an arrest warrant for eight counts of murder for Mr. Card. Um, and the reason it's eight counts because 10 people have not yet been identified. As those people are identified, uh, the counts will probably go to the total of 18. Um, he should be considered armed and dangerous. Police were monitoring the family home of Robert Card. A neighbor was unable to explain what had happened. The last time I saw him was two weeks ago when he was helping his father hay this field right here and perfectly normal. I mean, there was nothing out of the norm. It's never, it won't be the same. Nothing's going to be the same. Areas of Maine remain in lockdown with schools, doctor surgeries and grocery stores closed. Residents have been told to lock their doors. Amid fear, it's difficult to begin mourning the 18 victims of America's deadliest mass shooting this year. David Garrett, TVB News. Beijing authorities have eased fears about giant pandas' treatment abroad. They say the more than 60 loaned to zoos overseas are in good health. Three of them are currently in the U.S. but will return to the mainland next month. Tian Tian, Meixiang and Xiao Tiji are at the Smithsonian National Zoological Park in Washington, D.C. They're being prepared for their journey back to China. The zoo organized farewell events attracting large numbers of visitors. Tian Tian and Mei Xiang were sent to the U.S. in 2000. There, they have given birth to four babies. That's the news. Thanks for watching.